Good afternoon, everyone. This is Aarti Narayanan from ABS Marine Services. On behalf of the team and Maritime CEO, I welcome all of you to this live session on the skills needed by seafarers to excel. Our moderator this afternoon is Mr. Jagmeet Matar, who is IMEI Chair at the Indian Maritime University, Chairman of the Hong Kong Branch of the Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers and Director of Skills Plus Limited. Over to you, Mr. Jagmeet. Thank you very much, Arti. And I'm not going to, you know, talk about Sanya and the Maritime Shio right now because everybody knows what is happening. It's one of the most beautiful initiative that she has taken. So let me have the pleasure of uh, quickly introducing our panelists today. Uh, let me start with Subi, uh, Mr. P. B. Subia. He's head of Human Resources. Pacific Basin, and he is based in uh, Hong Kong. Then we have uh, Captain Pradeep Chavla, who is the Managing Director of Anglo Eastern Ship Management, also based in uh, uh, Hong Kong. Then we have Ms. Karen Orsel. She is the Chief Executive Officer of MF Shipping Group and Chair of the Royal Dutch Ship Owners Association. Then we have uh, NG, has NG joined? Not yet, okay, we'll wait for her. Then we have Mr. Amar Singh Thakur, General Secretary, Maritime Union of India. Then Mr. Abdul Ghani Sarang, General Secretary, come treasurer at the National Union of Seafarers of India. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure and uh, to have you here for this panel discussion, which is extremely uh, crucial and critical. We are going to be discussing about what are the skills seafarers need to excel. I know it's a very broad subject because when we talk about skills itself, it's like, you know, we are, are we talking soft skills? Are we talking hard skills? Are we talking about something which is inborn, something which can be trained? So it's a very wide sort of a thing. So let's uh, try and focus on certain specific ones. So let me start with Captain Chavla. Uh, Captain Chavla, how yes. important is it to identify the soft as well as the professional, or let us say, focus on competency skills needed in uh, seafarers? So what is the need and what is the importance of that? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, the future and what skills are required. Indeed, it is a vast topic as Jagmeet says. Whatever competencies we all had, and I think uh, when I say we, I include Jagmeet and people of my age uh, who were sailing many, 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 many years ago. Whatever skills we had are no longer valid because the whole scenario is changing. Navigation is changing. We navigated with the stars and sights and sun sights. That's no longer required. We had engineers who were taught how to touch and feel machinery and hear the <clears throat> sound of machinery in order to understand what was going wrong. That's no longer valid. Everything is off a screen on our ME engine today. The capability to identify faults today is through data rather than through touch and feel. So to start with, I think we need to st start with a new paradigm that whatever we knew is not good enough. We need to start all over again. The pace of change that is happening and that will happen in the next 20 years is going to be much faster than ever before. So what took 20 years to change will now take two years to change. So the seafarer cannot only be looking at skills that he is learning today. The seafarer will continuously be required to change and learn new stuff. So what will be the most important skill going forward probably will be his ability to continuously learn his or hers. I do realize that I should not be using only his and especially in this conference. Uh, but let's assume for the time being that if I do make the mistake, it's meant to be for both genders. Uh, 
the other thing is that they need to be able to work with short teams because a lot of control and command will change to the shore there will be much more of vts control there will be a lot more of joint decision making even in the engine room maintenance uh, because we have softwares which are now bringing all the machinery data into a dashboard on the people's screens in the office so the lord and master was a good relationship there was the lord and there was the master of the ship after that well that's going to change now because there are going to be a few warlords sitting ashore who will also be making joint decisions with the master and that ability to be interact with the teams ashore is going to be a major skill so soft skills is going to be the most crucial skill and i will elaborate more as we go through the different questions but for the opening one i would say that's going to be the most critical thing thank you uh, thank you very much sir uh, let me then jump over to uh, mr abdul ghani saran sir what what is your from your perspective uh, when we talk about the skills required uh, what would you value the most in the seafarers today well before i answer that particular question let me also mention my, i'm very happy to be here and what captain chawla mentioned about his generation and your generation he did mention that the new generation i'm very sure the generation before your generation also had the same words to say okay so it is a dynamic process and we are talking about you know you were talking about the new generation in your time your generation was the new generation and this is dynamic this will go on it will go behind and it will go further so the point uh, so that as i said it is a very dynamic and things are changing the pace at which it is changing to your specific question you see we also run a training academy like many other companies and any trainee who comes i'm starting from that training any trainee who comes and they all in need of job and they are searching means specifically i tell them that you are one of those 5000 who pass out every year why why should a company invest in you or should take you as as they are you are one of those 5000 who have received the same level of training so to for that seafarer to get more gainful employment our advice is you have to do something different you have to do something extra and we advise them to do some some better course some additional course other than the training which they had got for 6 months so that additional training will 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 have bear them out when they go for you know for the companies to take soft skill definitely the attitude definitely the attitude to urge the love to learn and to not be complacent and ever ever go on on the move of identifying the skill which needs to be done so i would say the attitude and the personal uh, uh, intention of that particular seafarer will take them much much further than the other seafarers so this is what i would say soft skill and the attitude to excel and as an and not be complacent so that they they are able to get the uh, more ground realities about getting uh, you know gainful employment in much much more much more paying situation also so i would you know like to stop here and you know the attitude and the personal intention of the seeker to to accept thank you thank you sir thank you very much and, and we will come back to attitude and soft uh, skills again and and as very rightly you said and captain chavla said it's the rate of change you know if we don't keep on learning in every respect we become obsolete very very soon last 20 years if we see the changes which have happened and the companies which did not cope up we are talking about the corporate perspective here so let's uh, listen from karen uh, what do you think I think it's already good afternoon uh, in India. Eh? So uh, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's it's an honor and pleasure to be with with these uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, co-speakers. I think I've done uh, uh, quite a few projects with, uh, and I, 
I apologize if I don't pronounce your names uh, correctly, but uh, I've done uh, quite some interesting uh, projects with the managing director of Anglo Eastern. So I'm very happy. I think it was a time ago that we met face to face a couple of years, unfortunately. Um, I think this is a very interesting and very good discussion on uh, of, uh, what both previous speakers said. Uh, it's all about soft skills, uh, continuously learning. Uh, uh, but I also would like to add two things, and especially because of the other uh, speakers, um, um, being a ship owner and ship manager ourselves, and uh, uh, we also see that in the Netherlands. Um, soft skills is 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 a, it's it's a huge topic, um, but I think it's uh, also interesting to hear from your perspective. Um, um, because we have the same discussion within the Netherlands, but I think also we should have it uh, on an international level, is um, of course we still have our basic needs uh, for training of your seafarers. And what we uh, envision or, or experience is that uh, because of the, uh, what you called uh, pace, uh, and the, the quickness of the new demands and the continuously learning, um, that means that that should we also look at um, uh, changing the basic needs or the basic training actually at the schools um, in order to prepare the next generation. Uh, and I think it was a, a, a good and I can give you a good example where in the Netherlands uh, there was a huge discussion for a long time. Um, um, why don't we uh, do similar things like in the uh, airplane industry, namely uh, uh, train on um, um, uh, have training for your actives or how to become a seafarer? If there is a shortage on uh, um, actual spaces on board uh, to be able to give them the trainee, can we? Uh, uh, and knowing that everything is becoming more and more automatically, uh, so why don't we make more use of a simulator with one specific comment, absolutely not meant to replace the ordinary training on board? Because I think that is key. Huh? To, to, to live and breathe and be on board of a vessel can never be replaced by a simulator. But I think looking at future demands, it is a realistic option to say, hey, uh, shouldn't we as an industry look at that? Uh, and I'm trying to tease everybody also a little bit to get a, get a little bit of a, a, a different uh, uh, interaction. But I, I think um, Netherlands try to, to um, um, discuss that within uh, um, the IMO. And at that time, a lot of countries said, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. But I think the uh, changes are going that rapidly. It, it is an interesting discussion how you your view is on that. Uh. Thank, thank you very much, Karen. I think it's, it's a fantastic point in terms of what is uh, basically required at the level where you require the minimum training, minimum skills as to comply and rest everything comes the value add in terms of soft skills which are again changing as i always say the biggest skill a person can learn is managing change because that's yeah. something which is the most important so i would like to bring in subi on this managing change and and the values that uh, uh, because subi is company pacific basin they like other companies they take a lot of women seafarers so i would like to request him to bring that in in, in his reply please <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Jagmeet, and very nice to meet you all. I'm really, really happy to be part of this panel. Um, first of all, I think it would be nice for all of us uh, in management generally to stop using the word soft skills and perhaps uh, start using the word human skills. Uh, when we say soft skills, and it's become such a well-known term, you know, the world over, it almost sounds like it is the opposite of hard skills. And in fact, while hard skills are simply the skills that you need to do your job, that's, 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 human skills are the skills that you need to be a better person and be a better leader. So when I think about human skills, I think about listening, empathy, patience, being able to effectively communicate, having a sense of self-awareness, being able to have confrontations in a respectful and effective manner, and also how to have difficult conversations. Because at the end of the day, those 19 or 20 or 22 people on the ships 
have to be really one cohesive unit communicating with one another day after day to get a good job done. Um, some of those skills are teachable, some of those skills are innate. And uh, when I think about whether any of these skills can be developed through training, I dare say that yes, some of them can, but not the type of training that uh, we are accustomed to seeing being done in you know, maritime training institutes or maritime colleges. I'm talking more about in terms of you know, the psychological aspect, giving people the opportunity to learn about themselves through a process of 360 peer reviews, through a process of psychometric evaluations which is slowly gaining hold in some shipping companies, but perhaps uh, you know, not as many that, uh, uh, that there should be. On the point of uh, managing change, uh, thank you, Jagmeet, for bringing that in. We in Pacific Basin have also, over the years, wondered how we will ever recruit women to work on board our ships. And then one fine morning, we realized that if there can be women working on the International Space Station, then there can definitely be women working on ships. If there can be an all-female flight crew in the cockpit and in the cabin on airlines like Air India, then there can definitely be women working on ships. No one can challenge that idea. So we started off about uh, two and a half years ago, and we started with one, and now we have about 64, 65 female seafarers on our ships from Philippines, mainland China, Hong Kong, and hopefully in the near future, we will start with India as well. So it's been a process of mindset change. It's been a process yeah. of giving our colleagues in the office an opportunity to understand that at the end of the day, if you take gender out of it, actually men and women are capable of doing exactly the same things in certain circumstances, of course. So with that, I'll stop to allow other people to talk about uh, their experience with women. on board. Thank you. Thank you, Subhi, for that. Uh, Mr. Thakur. Uh, can we have your perspective on what we have discussed just now? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity in this platform, the panel discussion. First of all, I'll say even like Captain Chavla said and uh, Abdul Ghani said, in the olden days, we never used to have any skills or any of this thing. And, you know, the uh, engine and machinery, and there are different types of machinery. It was always mechanical, this thing. But nowadays, day by day, the technology is changing. Every year, we are finding out different ways, different skills. So what I think hard skills are basically technical skills, which are necessarily hard to acquire. And that can be taught by learned and improved over time. But soft skills are not technical skills, such as teamwork, effective communication, leadership, time management, and flexible are very valued in the modern working place. These skills are more often challenging to develop since they have little to do with knowledge and experience. So for the CPL, in order to carry out work efficiently using modern day equipment, it is very important to have a soft skill development. Uh -huh. Only then can the actual potential of the CPL can be made use of. The answer to tackling the mental health issue of the CPL lies in providing relevant soft skills. So it is very, very important, the soft skills that you've given to the seafarers so they can work can uh, modern technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Now, since you mentioned about the mental health or mental well-being, so let me start with Captain Chavla. This uh, mental well-being, we have spoken a lot, especially the whole thing was brought up more into forefront because of COVID. Of course, this is the, something which has been always there, but this has suddenly become far more, people are getting more and more aware of it. So how is this being addressed by the stakeholders, uh, Captain Chavla, uh, especially looking at what they are, what the seafarers are going through today? Okay, I would like to kind of divide that into two separate sections. One is what is relevant for COVID and what is relevant for the general improvements. On the COVID side, I think the states have failed the ship owning community about not allowing people to sign off from the ports. I think it's, I would go to the extent of saying that it is grossly negligent on the part 
of the states not to look into this constituency, considering that we have managed to keep the trade flowing throughout the two years of COVID. The seafarers, without them, we wouldn't even be able to get masks to the US when they had a shortage or to get oil and gas in the winter time to any country. So I have repeatedly said this, that we need to probably be stronger in our voice to say, try stopping shipping for a week. We don't really need to stop it, but I think ITF and the unions and the ship owners associations together need to say this to the general public on CNN, on BBC and all the channels around to say that these would be the effects if we stopped for one week. All the ships, one ship the ever given with the Suez Canal was calculated to be making the economy of the world suffer by, I don't know, a couple of billion dollars or something. So if all the ships were to stop, what would be the cost to the world economy? Because without that, we are not getting, I mean, I am part of the Intertank OCMF and many other forums where this is being intermanager, et cetera, et cetera. We have been discussing in BIMCO, Intercargo, everywhere, but jointly, we have not been able to make the countries change their views about the small, very, very small risk that 1.5 million seafarers of the world would put on to the national health systems if they were allowed to go in corridors which are specifically designed for no contact with the local population. So that's affecting mental well-being of all seafarers today. One and only major thing. The seafarers are resilient people. They can handle a lot of things, but not getting home for 10, 12 months is not something they signed up for. So that's the primary thing for well being in COVID times. Now, when it comes to general well being, I think we needed the MLC because a section of the community of our industry was not doing what was necessary for the Bill of Rights of seafarers. And that's why we needed a minimum standard legislation. The good companies have never had a problem with their seafarers with respect to doing everything that they can to help the seafarer and his well-being, whether that is emotional, physical, medical, everything included, the good companies have always taken care of. We've had welfare offices assigned to every office of recruitment that we have around the world, at least for the last 25 years. Uh, they stay in touch with the families, they help out, sign-offs are done on compassionate grounds. All the stuff that is being talked about today has been done by the good companies forever. Even when 40 years ago when I was sailing, companies were doing that. Uh, so what do we now need to do more? I think the stigma that is associated with mental health is still something that needs to be tackled in our industry. The minute a seafarer signs off a ship due to a so-called mental issue, uh, which could be depression, which could be being upset about something that's happening in his family, the minute the seafarer does that, the manning industry kind of starts to put him into a little corner to say, okay, here's your cap for sitting out in the corner and let's review whether we're gonna take you back or not. That I think is bad on account of our community that we still do not consider a issue with the mental health at the same level as a physical ailment. I mean, when we get hurt, everybody can see it. But when the person is hurting from inside, that's not seen. And that stigma that is associated with it is it's a society problem. I think many countries around the world still look at going to a therapist as, you know, something not nice. And society does not encourage people to seek help from psychologists and psychiatrists. And that needs to change. And I think this is completely uh, something that can be done in our industry because we are not handling 
8 billion people, we are handling 1.5 million people. And we should be able to have a more uh, kinder, empathetic view towards it. And I personally feel that even if this requires legislation or going into the CBAs to say that this should be done, I would be supportive of that to say that we as a community need to be kinder, gentler, uh, more understanding. A seafarer leaves his family for six months uh, knowing fully well that there are things which he may not be around to help. But if there is a need that compassion should be there to bring him back to his family when there is an issue with the family. And it is something that is not nice about uh, our community at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pradeep. I know you have to move on to the next uh, panel, but please stay with us as long as you can. And uh, wherever if you feel like adding some something to it, any value add, please feel free to uh, speak in between. So let me go go back, go to uh, Mr. Abdul Ghani Saran. Two main issues, sir. I'm going to just talk about two main things which Captain Chavla started. One is the governments and the people who run the governments, they are very well qualified. You know, the civil servants everywhere in every country. Is it that they care a damn about seafarers or is it something which is called lack of awareness? Or is it our fault that we haven't made them realize mm -hmm. that there are certain things which need to be done? That's one part. And the second thing is, as, as very rightly said by Captain Chavla is, it's an illness. Mental illness is like physical illness. And it, there are, there are this treatment for it. And there's a stigma attached to it. So uh, Mr. Abdul Ghani Saran. Yeah. And I would request you to please be as open. Whatever words need to be used, they need to be used because some key take takeaways must go out from this uh, discussion today. Now, on the first point, I'll be you know I will now open up on the point about the governor's insensitivity. They are selfish for their own vested interests. They like to take the goods which are brought in by the seafarers, but don't allow the seafarers for screw change. And also for even for medical reasons. So the government, and it is not that they are not aware. At every forum, nationally, internationally, the governments are made aware at the ILO level, IMO level, United Nations, and whatever forum. But some of the government, there are some governments who really do a good job, you know, who are very practical. Like if you take the case of India, India led the world in the crew chain by the chartered flight, so many thousands and thousands, more than two lakh seafarers. India led the world and continued to lead the world because of the government policy about facilitating the seafarers crew chain. Now, as he was, uh, Captain Chawla was mentioning, you know, about the protest. Let me tell you, this is the first time at the open forum outside the ITF office, uh, ITF meeting I'm disclosing. On the 15th of this month, I had moved a proposal from NUSI in the ITA that we should have a worldwide protest, not just the Indian seafarers, not just the worldwide, all seafarers at one given day, we should have a protest. GMT, we'll decide the day, we'll decide the GMT time. All seafarers, all ranks of seafarers throughout the world should have a protest. Now we are working on that. We, within our IT family, we are working on that, how to make it successful, how, what are the practical implications, so we are there. And we said, you know, Christmas is just around the corner, let us do it before Christmas or New Year, you know, so people will be more re realize the government particularly. On the point of the well-being uh, counseling, we as NUSI, we have our own 24 by 7 counseling of seafarers for all ranks of seafarers and it has been continuing for the last three years. Now we, you know, our own we are doing it and it is toll free, just not for the seafarers but also their family members ashore, any family member of the seafarer because the seafarer is doing a good job, a large of the credit goes to the family who is taking care at home. You know, that is how the sea, so we are taking care of not just the seafarers but also the family members 
toll free 24 by 7. Now, these are expert counselors who advise, we can only give counseling to a level. And then if it is goes beyond, then they have to take more further you know, medical advice that we don't go into that, but to a level of counseling. So we have done it and many other countries and many associations are also doing. And in fact, it was one of our charter of demand in the last charter of demand with the ship owner that every company should have a you know, mental well-being officer. They should have companies on their own. They do it, but as a policy, as a fraternity, we should have a mental well-being officer to take care of this particular aspect of mental well-being, which as very rightly mentioned, awareness has to be created. If I have a toothache, I will go to a dentist. If I have a, you know, something going in my eye, I will go to a, you know, eye surgeon. But if I have something mentally depressing, I don't go to a psychiatrist because there is a stigma attached. So this is what we need to come up. And we are, as a as an industry, as an individually, companies are doing, unions are doing, to take care of this mental well-being of the seafarers. And watch out for the space when we when we announce officially by the IPF about that protest. And it should be coming anytime soon. Thank you. So, a very, very quick comment on that when People think that ship owners are the Santa Clauses. I don't think the governments are going to be affected by this sort of thing. It's the ship owner is going to suffer and the charters are going to put the ships off fire. Okay, let me, let me come to uh, Subi uh, on this one. When we say the skills, having a good mental resilience, is that a skill to be able to judge the emotional intelligence and the empathy and the uh, you know, qualities like that. So is that a sort of skill which the companies or the stakeholders would expect the seafarers to have, or it's a disease which can happen with anyone? It's a disease that can happen to anyone. When you think of resilience, the technical, the technical explanation for the word resilience is the ability to bounce back from a stressful situation. So in most companies, and certainly in PB, I would argue, why should an employee even be faced with a stressful situation in order to have the resilience to bounce back from it? And therefore, companies must always take care, especially in the shore-based organization, to ensure that stressful situations don't exist. But COVID is different. Uh, we, uh, we are facing what we are facing due to reasons completely beyond our control. And yes, of course, it's uh, expedient to say, oh, people should have a slightly uh, you know, thicker uh, skin and you know, try to cope with what is going on. But at the end of the day, that does not come automatically. Not everybody is an automaton. Not everybody has the same amount of emotional strength. And therefore, it's very important on the part of the companies to give our people on board the ships the necessary tools or the necessary care that they need in order to survive through this difficult period. So from our perspective, one of the things that we have been doing for the last two years is increased engagement, increased vocal expressions of gratitude to all of our seafarers yeah. from the CEOs of the companies. Yeah. You know, continuously letting them know, guys, we are just so grateful to you. We are so sorry, our hands are tied, you know that, but anything that we can do for you, let us know, we will do. The second thing that we have done is and you know, as an owner that has rather deep pockets, we have been very, very fortunate in the ability to reposition almost 90 of our vessels during the last, during the first 18 months of the pandemic. We repositioned 90 of our vessels from the Atlantic trades down to the Philippines and to China just to facilitate crew changes, even though the economic cost was great. But we are not counting the economic cost. The, Matt, the fact of the matter was these boys and girls needed to get off the ships and go home. And we told our teams in London, New York, and other places, please start fixing the ships back to Asia. So that was the only way that we could do it. Certainly, more money helps, but it's not the only thing, right? In many cases, you, we do have situations where, you know, the captains would talk to their crew and they'd say, you know what, if you gave everyone an extra $300 a month until they reached home, it might smooth things over. And we said, yeah, sure, absolutely. Anything that helps. Um, the fourth thing is uh, counseling services. So we have engaged the services of one company in Germany, uh, which is actually founded by a young uh, former lawyer from Incent Company, who has 
24 hour counseling services in about 16 different languages for all seafarers around the world for a fairly affordable fee. So PB signed a contract with them and we've told all of our seafarers, pick up the phone, call them anytime, and please know that it's okay to be not okay. Don't hide the fact that you're feeling some discomfort inside that you feel ashamed to talk to your colleagues about. Because at the end of the day, we all have to stand up for one another. If someone else stands up for you when you have difficulty, the chances are higher that you will stand up for someone else when they have difficulty. So it's really about a heightened level of care, a heightened level of empathy, perhaps a level to which we in shipping companies are not usually accustomed. Because like Captain Chala said, seafarers are tough people, they will get on with it. They will complain very little, they will take the rough with the smooth and they will do their six month contract and they will go home. But now that everyone is doing 12 month contracts or even more, then it's really incumbent on us as responsible owners and managers to up the game and make sure that the people feel really, really valued. I, I will say one more thing, um, lack of awareness. In Hong Kong, there was a, you know, Hong Kong has also had strict rules about uh, quarantine and so on. A gentleman living in Hong Kong, uh, in a very affluent uh, sort of uh, neighborhood of Hong Kong, wrote an article to the Hong Kong South China Morning Post, which is a newspaper here criticizing the Hong Kong government for allowing ships to come into Hong Kong Harbor for bunkering. And he described those ships as cesspits of contagion. If there is any lack of awareness, I think that beats it all. I tracked this gentleman down. He's actually owned an art gallery about four kilometers away from our office. And I went there one Saturday morning, I introduced myself and I said, we are a company that owns and operates 280 cesspits of contagion. Will you please come to our office anytime you like and let us teach you what we do, how we do and why we do. He was really surprised. He said, oh my God, you read my article in the South China Morning Post. I said, yes, I did. We left, I left five minutes later. He never bothered to come to our office or contact me again. But this is the level of you know, lack of awareness. This man is living in the richest neighborhood in Hong Kong, consuming all of the wonderful goods that seafarers bring into Hong Kong day after day. And he has the temerity to call ships cesspits of contagion, like as if he's living in some other century. It was really shocking. Thank you very much, Savi. Uh, Karen. I think there are a lot of number of threads which have come out and, but Sanjam can't, won't be able to give us another one hour. So we need to get everybody's views. Uh, Karen, please take your time and, and try and bring together some of the concepts and thoughts. No, I, I, I think uh, it's a great discussion. And, and what I actually want to, to, to emphasize uh, uh, for, for the whole audience here is that, uh, it's very obvious our uh, industry is unique, but we are very proactive also on the mental health issues. If and and I'm just trying to give the example because I'm, hey, I'm my town here. It's a small town compared to to anything uh, all of you are living. But we have a huge industry part here with factories and things like that. I'm unaware of any of uh, those industry being so proactive on recognizing, hey, we have an issue, we need to step on up on mental health. We um, um, are offering courses, we are there for the family, we recognize the need. Uh, that is something uh, um, I think, uh, uh, and, and maybe a, a step back to COVID, um, that is something we, also experienced, I think, all of us in our private lives, uh, uh, also the colleagues here, they all of a sudden felt like, hey, ooh, uh, uh, I am limited in my uh, 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 freedom. Um, and uh, I try, I, I initially I teased and I said, okay, now we all know how it feels to be a seafarer because this is their life. So what it is, is so different for us compared to a seafarer who's, um, uh, space of freedom is even more limited. So what can we do to make make uh, 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 everybody aware? And I, I think it's it's similar as every uh, uh, previous speaker said, we uh, uh, need to have helplines, give them courses, make the families aware that uh, we're there to support them. And I think this is a step 
which is unique for our industry. Uh, and I see that as a, I want to highlight that as a very positive because we all recognize that we need each other. Uh, we uh, uh, need to uh, make sure uh, the people who work for us uh, and who we all consider as, as colleagues feel comfortable and, and are still willing to uh, uh, continue this great job being a seafarer, because I think it's, it's a unique, eh? we are a unique un industry and uh, uh, all of these things which we are doing, uh, uh, um, um, of course we need to shake as much as we can, uh, 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 like uh, um, a previous speaker said, uh, um, I'm also on the International Chamber of Shipping, ICS, uh, uh, Intertanko, name it. Um, it's a lack of governments, and I think it's not only on awareness, I think it's a lot of protecting, uh, uh, maybe out of fear, um, where uh, there is a case on board, uh, that they are afraid that, that uh, uh, at that moment, um, their national legislation is, is what is the biggest challenge for all of us. So every country with its own specific needs, uh, and I, gave, I have a good example because Holland uh, or the Netherlands just became co um, uh, uh, code red again. And immediately the Philippines steps up and says, no, 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 any seafarer who has been flying via Amsterdam is unallowed to go back home. And we said, sorry, but where is all the agreements we had in place for the seafarers? They need to go home. And then again, it's like going back 18 months, but trying to do everything on the different levels in order to make the people be able to go home. Um, and, I, and I think it, that's a good example because I think it's good for, for the whole audience here to also uh, are listening to hear from us that uh, as a collective industry and everyone individually tries to do their uh, not only best efforts but goes really really far in order to say hey uh, we are there for 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 all of you we recognize you uh, you are not just a thing you are important you have we care for you so we will go all the way to make sure uh, we do whatever we can and and, and I really wanted to emphasize that in a positive way and yes i am aware that the unions uh together with the ship owners actually said why don't we take this next step we are aware it might be at a certain cost but we tried several times so what is the next step we could do and i think the ever given was a very good example everybody in the world started uh, uh, becoming nervous where are my goods because there's a big vessel <laughs> uh, um, uh, stuck in Egypt for a long time and that had a huge impact and I and I maybe shouldn't be saying that not because uh, uh, I liked it but I liked it in a way because it attracted a lot of media attention and people uh, in the street were like whoa ooh, uh, that uh, I can't get my television because it's stuck on the ever given and I said yeah now you know how important our whole industry is. So that's my small contribution there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I think uh, Captain Chavla has to leave. So just very quickly, I will ask him one follow-up question, then move on to Mr. Thakur, and then we will continue with that. Uh, Pradeep, when, when we, you started this part of it, and I'm so happy, and everybody has <clears throat> come out with fantastic ideas, <clears throat> just to uh, it may not be directly linked with skills, but the mental health part, uh, the communication to be able to explain the empathy to the seafarers, from whom, who does it? The people who do it sitting in the office, do they have the skills to be able to do it? So these are, these are in general, the, the entire level itself has to be raised where the people who are talking to the breadwinners on board the ship, the people who are the most important ones who are keeping the wheels and, and, and uh, of the global economy turning. So sir, uh, what is it that you feel needs to be done in order to upgrade that? 
I think you are right about the fact that every level of management in any company needs to speak the same language, one of empathy, compassion, etc. And yes, there will be people sitting in offices who are not having the right skill sets for it. What we as a company did is about two years ago, we started this complete change of culture program with a particular US company called PPI. Uh, he's a famous guy by the name of Tim Autry, who's written a lot of a couple of books. So the skill sets that we have been trying to encourage in middle management, who is directly in contact with the ship, the vessel manager, is to be able to bring up their knowledge about what is mental well-being, mm -hmm. because quite often, and this is partly because of the historical nature of the macho shipping people that we were. There is a very important historical context about this. The shipping community got trained in the 1950s and 1960s together with the Naval Academies in many cases, in many countries. And the Merchant Navy was like an adjunct of the national navies. And that having those common academies also brought in a bit of the macho culture that is probably necessary for armed forces of any country. And from that, it grew into this thing that seafarers are different and they are more hardier than an average person, which is of course not true in terms of mental health. Uh, we are subject to the same emotional pressures that anybody else in society is. So that led to the reason why this industry is a little bit more macho than some of the others and why the understanding is uh, had to be brought in. So I fully agree with you that middle management around the offices also needs to be coming up to speed on that. And each company will need to bring about because if the top management is talking about mental well-being and the vessel manager isn't, then the whole thing fails. And hence, it is important that people on the front line are speaking the same language and are genuinely empathetic and compassionate because the seafarer is not stupid, right? If he sees that the words are different from the deeds, then he stops believing in you as a company. And that is very important that they get their actual deeds that does the crew department really relieve people compassionately or not. Never mind what the CEO is saying in the company seminars. And that is important for every company to understand that. Thank you. I guess I better move over to the other panel now. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Thakur, there are few few threads here. One of them is the mental health. We talked about the skill sets which is required. Uh, we talked about the inaction by the governments. So I leave it to you, whichever areas you would like to uh, touch upon and give your views. Sir, you're, you're muted, sir. See, uh, come on, I didn't hurt your power communication with the gap, the servants. So what I, what I said was that there are few concepts which we discussed in the last five, 10 minutes. And yeah. my apologies, I couldn't come back to you sooner because Pradeep had to leave. So yeah. we talked about the mental health. We talked about the uh, skill sets in terms of, you know, we always thought like as Pradeep said, the macho merchant Navy guys, oh, it's, it's only for men. The women are not meant for that, all that stuff. So specific question, if you allow me to ask you, I would basically uh, look at more that what is your opinion about increased gainful employment uh, to women seafarers without proactive and real support will the companies be able to walk the talk or it is just going to remain in big lectures and, yes, and nothing is going to happen yeah it's a very big concern you know it's a male dominated industry so it is very difficult to say this, but it, our main motto, we are always, by MUI and NUSI, we are uh, pressing upon them 
that take a more women seeker and give them opportunity so every day in the meeting also but none of the uh, companies are telling them yes sir, definitely we will take the seeker women seeker will be given to preferred priority but no one is coming forward when the if you go and tell them you take the women seeker they say yes sir we will take so somehow government should also think over it and until now we are trying to put in the cb and when the ne next next year come we try to tell the owners ki you be give some percentage some percentage for the women cb and it start from 5 to 10% so that their entry should be made available so i thanks to sci at the sci started because their full ship which was made by the women cb so they have proved that women cb are not less than the men cb so definitely we are trying to improve and try to press the all the ship owners and we are we are trying or we uh, recent negotiation also mvi to see uh, made the pressure on the ship owner ki you have to take women cb they they, they do see gender diversity should be there they are all are equal when they say the cb they do see men that is cb he or she that is he is a cb so you must take given them opportunity so employment definitely will increase for the women cb that will make sure right sir thank you very much now i'm just going to throw a very uh, a common question it's a difficult question uh, we just had a talk in the morning where we had uh, uh, the future leaders of the industry the young boys and girls and uh, this is a question i'm just going to coming out of that discussion just leave it to you all men and women are physiologically different would the should the companies make policies which are supportive because when a woman seafarer is working on board the ship there are certain things which like during the during the month you have those cycles and uh, also you are also raising a family and uh, there are issues about sanitary pads on board the ship the disposal of that how many companies are actually taking that into consideration and recognizing and realizing how important it is that there are certain uh, women where such that duration of 3 4 5 days is very heavy and very difficult so i'm just leaving it open because this is a very essential important point we make talk about women seafarers what are we doing to make things workable and easier and compassionate empathetic for them it's open anyone can can join in please yes please yeah okay you know women seafarers as earlier speakers have also said there are many scenarios one scenario is that there are people who want to employ women seafarers but because of some logistic reason because of the come you know the principle they are not able to do that but the intent is there they were genuinely want to employ another scenario where people just make they can employ women seafarers they can but on the public forum they will say yes yes women seafarers should be employed we need to do that yes but when they go in the confines of their own offices they actually make mockery about it you know who is going to why should we but on the public forum to be politically correct to be seen a very you know a good person they will on the public forum then there are third scenario is that there are people who are genuinely want to employ women seafarers and they ensure that they can they women seafarers are given breaks in their companies so this is the third scenario i would say that genuinely they want to employ and they make efforts genuine efforts to get them employed but it will only be possible if at the top level the ceos of the company their awareness is there and they are very keen not just lip service they have to be very keen in employing women seafarer if that at the top level is a mindset is there subia did mention about the mindset in, in his first intervention the mindset has to be there at the top level 
then it will it is easier to filter it down at the you know at the below level at the manager level at the you know other levels and yes if and those companies as mentioned sci definitely sci in india shipping corporations of india has taken a lead other companies are also following those company who are who are employing women seafarers they they factor that in that you know about the physiological things which you mentioned and definitely they will you know look into that and they do look into that at the top level and here i would just want to you know mention when we talk about women seafarers let us not take away the credit of the thousands and hundreds and thousands of women seafarers who are working on the cruise ships already they are working but they are because they are cruise ship our mindset is so focused on merchant ship merchant ship the cargo ship the tankers and the bulk carriers we don't give them the credit of the women seafarers who are already in, in a large number they are working on the cruise ship so i just didn't want to take away the you know the credit which they have already on cruise ship it is not that women seafarers are not there they are already there in large numbers but on the merchant ship the numbers has to increase and definitely companies who do take women seafarers they factor all this uh, thing that the well being of the women seafarers thank you thank you sir thank you um, anyone else karen you i think uh, um we okay so we yeah, he has his hands up that's why i was waiting sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right so we have oh, go we ahead, have go ahead. two minutes so four minutes so i would say two minutes two minutes or okay one two 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 one i don't know <laughs> i'll make it very quick so we don't hire women seafarers because it looks cool on social media okay we hire women because it's good business the fact of the matter is we need to continue to diversify our manning sources regardless of nationality or whatever it is if you can just add just you know female keen female seafarers around the world that would make our whole manning effort that much easier and therefore it's good business we cannot force women to work on our ships but every company can learn to keep its doors open to women and not say oh no women can't do the job of seafarers because like i've said before women work on the international space station so i think it's absolutely critical for companies to realize that the only true policy uh, initiative that you really need to consider is to understand one simple fact and that is men and women are different that's all whether women have something going on for 3 or 4 days of the month and men don't that is an entirely personal matter and if a company in the shore based organization can give a woman a day and a half off or two days off once a month for these issues then why can't we do it on a ship is the whole ship going to collapse because one of the female seafarers on board couldn't work for two days no it won't so that's where i think simple implementation tools that if i can just share very quickly in pb 2 years ago we had zero women today we have 64 we have them on at the moment 30 ships at the rate of two women per ship we always put two together there will be one senior and one junior sailing on the same ship they always have private accommodation with private shower and bath facilities we always pick ships where either the captain or the chief engineer has daughters of the same age as our seafarers that is an absolutely critical element because that is so helpful in ensuring that at the get go the system of treatment of the new crew on board who are women is no problem at all because we pick ships with captains and chief engineers who have daughters of the same age as our seafarers and that's a really really important thing is not always possible but definitely we try and make sure that's possible about 80 or 90% of the time thanks subhi thank you so very quickly karen you got 1 minute and 20 yeah. seconds what can we add to that i mean i think uh, 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 that says yes. it all and 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 i think our experience is we have tinier ships to be honest so uh, uh, but we do a lot of effort and it's about company culture uh, lead lead by example uh, be positive uh, but especially also uh, um, uh, what we uh, also recognize is that they sim the females and anyone on board wants to be part of a team they don't mm. want always want to be uh, uh, um yeah uh, uh treated differently so often the cases or the issues we are talking about they solve them themselves uh but it's 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 
very obvious that you need the good backup and the support and the recognition that there are differences. And uh, yeah, I mean, previous speaker said it all. So it's, it's hard to add anything to that. Uh, so yeah. let Thank me stop you. here. <laughs> <laughs> really, really appreciate that. And with this, I think we are at the end of it. Can to I, everyone, yeah. thank you very much. Can uh, I say one, one quote? Sir, we, yeah. sir, we, may, we may be cut off. So, <laughs> I'll let me take a chance on this quote. Here to stage okay. woman power, give them a fair break and see them prosper and flower. Thank you. Yes. Good. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. And let's walk the talk. That's that's so very important. And uh, thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you, Jeet.